So Fable, as I said, well, that's dark. Is it possible to brighten that up a little bit? Feel the light. And is, it, is it also possible to get the audio working on it? Um, and these are some of these environments you're going to see here that are completely outside the story. They're just things that you can explore. These are all these locations, all these towns, all these cities are total simulations, total economic simulations. These people sitting down at the pub are nothing to do with the story at all. You just wander in there and they're drinking. You can do things like start bar fights. You can steal people's pints. You can even spit in people's pints. Um, and that is, that essentially is, is, is pretty amazing. Just trying to get these environments which really surprise and shock people. Um, all the towns that we've got within Fable have their own crime system, so you can become you can become famous within those towns, or you can become totally infamous in the towns. Well, the video that when this was taken, this is a free cam flying around the world. So the character is off somewhere else. Ships come and deliver stock. That stock is delivered to the, to the shops. The prices in the shops will change. Most players will never even see this, but if you want to, you can hide in the bush and mug one of those people that are carrying the crates off there. This is all emergent gameplay that you see. While we're watching this video, is there any questions? I won't talk to the whole of the video because it's fairly self-explanatory. Uh, self Has anyone got any questions about the design process or anything I've said? Or? Disagreeing on the subject of interfaces, I was wondering if you'd share your thoughts about the future, particularly from the perspective of like the gesture system that you worked on in black and white, eye yeah. toy, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the gesture system was an interesting experiment. It took, I mean, it turned out that in concept, I really liked the idea that you could paint down different different and unlock different things in the game. The only trouble is it actually required quite a little bit of skill. And so the interesting thing is we had to, as we were going through Black and White, and, and indeed in Black and White too, we had to give alternatives to it. But I reckon, and this is a real personal point of view, the greatest innovation in hardware won't come from the next graphics processor, or the next uh, processor, or the next console, or even the next PC. It'll someone somewhere will come up with an input device that enables us to do games that we haven't even imagined before. And I sort of reinforced that with, if you remember with the old um, Nintendo 64, where they had that little nipple on the joypad. You know, you could, you, you could play GoldenEye, and that was a completely different experience because you had that little nipple there. So I reckon there is going to be somewhere, someone is going to come up with a second generation controller because I would argue that the controllers that we have now were designed to actually move around 2D worlds and they've been hybrided for 3D worlds but they're still not, not good enough and the number of times that you have to go through and rejig your game because of the controllers. Any other questions? Any, any other questions at all? Hello. I just wanted to clarify, this is running on Xbox 7, right? Yeah, that's right, it's running on the Xbox. Within 64 meg, impressively. It started off incidentally about three months ago within 128 meg, which is a big amount of Next question. Yeah, Peter, you talk about there becoming, a, or there, there being a second generation controller out there on someone's mm. mind, on someone's desk. Mm. What is that? I know you, I think you use the word controller generically. Do you actually mean something in your hand or how can you sort of elaborate on your... Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I mean, the, it's really interesting that we've got, um, we've got things like the iToy, which is this sort of unlimited, you know, you don't have to be, you're not limited by any controller there. But the only thing is about the iToy is, the only problem I've got is it's bloody exhausting to play games. I mean, I have to have I have to have energy drinks after about five minutes, and the thought of actually playing a sort of twenty-hour gaming experience—you'd be like an international bodybuilder at the end of it. And forget, forget Pilates. I mean, you know, you you know, this is this is a, a, a real effort. I mean, we also for black and white. There was a really exciting 
moment where this company came to us and said, we have this glove. And this glove allows you to control and manipulate the world and put it on. And of course, Black and White had this hand. Brilliant. I thought, this is going to be fantastic. You know, being able to grip a tree and grab a person is going to be fantastic. Actually, because you weren't, because your mind wasn't gripping anything, there was no sensational feedback, it actually was pretty tough to control the game. So there's lots of blind alleys, I think. There's lots of alleys that will lead to something else, and I'm sure the eye toy, or something like the eye toy, will lead to it. I mean, it's, it could be things like, I mean, there's some interesting research going on onto um, eye motion detection and pupil, watching people's pupils, interesting on biofeedback, I mean, lots of interesting stuff. I mean, there's even been a game, I believe, and I never tried it myself, where you could actually think and you could think, go left, and you would go left. I don't know how it worked. I mean, what happens if you random I mean, men are supposed to have sexual thoughts every 15 seconds, so God knows what would happen if one of those slipped in while they were in the middle of playing a game. But there are going to be, I'm sure there are going to be lots of interesting uh, um, evolutions. What it does need, though, it's no good for, for a small company to develop it into be an add-on, because the big problem is us supporting it. Is going to require you know, a fairly major effort from other manufacturers. The next question. Uh, as, you, as, you, as these games require more and more manpower, um, how are you offsetting some of the costs? Are, are you outsourcing more? Are you using contractors? <coughs> yeah, I mean, we, we have a, a big outsourcing resource in places like Estonia. Um, we're using an awful lot of people for, for things like art and innovation. We're actually using a little bit of uh, programming outsourcing as well. Um, and that is costing an awful lot more. And of course, for developers, that's tough. I mean, I think people heard Jason Rogan's talk um, yesterday, and I actually agree with a lot of his points, is that the development community it, you know, has a tough time at the moment, not least of which because the amount of money that it costs to develop a game is huge, it's vast, and uh, that means that you've got to be absolutely professional. I think we've got time for one more question, unfortunately. Uh, person from mine. Thank you. Uh, you talked about how games take obviously a very long time and they have a very long production. So I was wondering if you could just walk us through a little bit. Um, Faces of production that you go through, okay, uh, and also <coughs> how, how, how you keep that focus and keep the team going the Yeah, I mean, it starts with a simple concept document. The temptation is to write a huge design document that is going to encompass absolutely everything, but I would say a simple design document, no more than 10 pages long. The front top of that design document is that one single line, and then finding a team that is enthusiastic and believes in it, that is crucially important because they're going to be working on it for years. They've got to believe in the concept. And that team is usually sort of starts off around about six or seven people, and they're just working on, really, they're working on some of the technology that's going to be necessary, they're working on some of the design stuff, making the design a bit more detailed, producing what we call a test bed. Now, even as far back as uh, games like um, theme park and syndicate we've had test beds that we could play around with the risk some of the risky area not to do with graphics but more to do with with uh, gameplay and and a little bit more with AI now and that then iterates around we, we keep going around that to keep testing testing that experience presenting it to people within Lionhead seeing if that's right and eventually when that has hit all the tick boxes if you like of, of quality and of addressing all the problems we move into the prototype stage and the team goes up to about between 10 and 15. Then they're working on how they're going to get some solutions of some of their technology, trying to get to the end of the prototype stage a little slice of the game, a little slice of something that's playable. Now that could be in even in using something like Director, it's not necessarily using uh, the in-game technology. And again, we'll iterate around that until we're happy with that technology, until we've got a full design document, a full production plan, and then eventually that will move into full production. So try to make the evolutionary process up front rather than back end it as we used to. And then finally, into the nightmare of production. Okay, thank you very much indeed.